We need to hurry up with those green science minds, as plain Mike has run out of real text to research and is blatantly wasting resources on useless text like physical damage upgrade 1. What the heck Mike? Anyway, let's take a closer look at the requirements for green signs. A green signs pack requires a yellow belt and a yellow inserter, which together amounts to 5.5 iron and 1.5 copper. That would be very bleh to properly ratio out, were it not for our 900 signs per minute mad magic. Ultimately, we will simply need 5.5 belts of iron and 1.5 belts of copper to make all the stuff we need for one belt of green signs. Now, where do we find all of those resources? After a bit of pondering, we decided it's too much of a pain to bring all future resources to the base through the North Corridor only, and decide to open a second Red Chunk Corridor to bring resources into our base. That simplifies things a lot, as we start off by mining this 4.7 million copper patch right outside of our base space, exchanging 20 or so pristine green chunks for a belt and a half of red copper which instantly fulfills the green science copper requirements. Notice we are only mining from the sixth center of the patch, ignoring the copper in the forested southern chunk. Both to preserve some trees and to preserve another row of green chunks, and we're ignoring the northern half of the copper patch, so we can still bring up to 18 belts of resources to the base through the very same chunk the copper mine is in. In fact, we have drawn a bunch of belt icons on the map as well, trying to determine the optimal location of the southern resource corridor, which connects directly to a large iron patch in the south. And from there we can easily branch out to other patches of iron, copper, that 10 million coal patch we skipped earlier, and even oil in the far far future. No infrastructure at all has been placed in the corridor yet, so all of the red chunks you see here originate purely from biter bases. That means that opening the southern corridor will only sacrifice another dozen or so green chunks to the great johnnies in the sky. Now, manually building mining outposts is one of the most annoying activities one has to do in the pre-bot era of Factorio. And my god, we're gonna have to build a lot of manual mining outposts. But believe it or not, in this playthrough we have found something even more annoying than building mining outposts. Which is belting all the ore back to our home base in the most peculiar and restrictive ways imaginable. First of all, the optimal route is literally going through biter bases, as that is where the 5x5 red chunk areas are originating from. Which, if you remember, is the same 5x5 red chunk area that any of my base elements create around themselves. That means that the iron from this 7 million iron patch here, which needs to be transported to the furnace area located a mere 10 chunks north as the pterodactyl flies, actually departs on its journey to the base southwards, away from the base, before turning west, meeting up with the other green signed iron patch, and then continuing along the belt corridor until it finally reaches the base through the green signed copper patch chunk. A journey which is at least four times as long as a simple direct belt. You may have noticed the second annoying issue on the way already. Trees! Not so much single trees, but the all around omnipresent god dang forests everywhere. Granted, I did select this map precisely because it has those god dang forests everywhere, because they're as much of a blessing as they are a curse. Instead of having a single holy tree of wisdom as per usual, almost every single tree is sacred on this map, as these magnificent pollution absorbing forests, more on those in a future episode, 
will be the only thing standing between my super polluting central mega base and the extremely trigger happy biters outside of my fenced off area. If they get so much of a whiff of pollution smell, they'll send in the unstoppable attacks which I will simply be defenseless against, figuratively as well as literally. So we are kind of forced to leave as many trees standing as possible, using undergrounds as much as we can. And while we are utilizing the copy paste function to copy a section of belts, hover it over the forests and then try to cut trees so that there are no red gaps greater than 4 tiles to be bridged by underground belts, in Factorio 1.1 this would still be extremely annoying as the sick roof of leaves blocks your entire vision. But a new feature in Factorio 2.0 drops this method to only being pretty annoying, as now we can read whole belt for the circuit network, which puts some of those nice bowling alley side rails up along the entire connected belt. Indeed, connected belts, which means we can see if the belt coming out of the far side of the forest is still actually connected to the belt going in, without having to manually drop items on the slow yellow belts and wait several eternities for them to come out on the other side. If at all. The much improved smart belt dragging, which automatically places underground to bridge up uh, tunnel under obstructions whenever possible, further drops the process to being only mildly annoying, which is kind of in line with the rest of this playthrough, so that's good enough for me I suppose. Anyway, these two giant iron patches containing 8 and 7 million iron respectively should together be able to provide the 5.5 belts of iron ore required for green signs for quite a while. I foolishly join up the half belt of iron with the half belt of copper right there at the copper patch. Which will surely not morph into one of the most Frankensteinian blankets of Tagliatelli when we inevitably need to pass by other belts and connect in replacement ore patches for green signs later on. Well, after painstakingly hand building another 7 belt smeltery which we managed to tuck away into another weird outcrop of my base space, leaving only one tile at the edge for the separated radar power line to pass by, We are finally ready to turn on the green science furnace area. And it's about time too, because playing Mike is researching lamps. We gotta get that guy back on track, man. You might think we are close to getting green signs up and running now, but no. The northernmost coal patch has been spreading pollution more than expected, and it has been a delicate balance act to keep it from polluting the active biters. There is only one way to solve that problem. Efficiency modules. Yeah, no, we won't have access to any pollution reducing options for a long time still. Our only option is using a different coal mine. And since we've declared a clear path to the base to the southern corridor now, we are gonna be mining that 10 million coal patch, which by itself is gonna be able to provide the base with enough coal until we need to make several belts of plastics for red chips in the far far future.
A stone furnace stack uses 1.08 coal per second to smelt a full belt of plates, which means a single belt of coal can easily supply the 10 furnace stacks smelting plates for red and green signs with coal to spare. With 4 more coal belts incoming, we can run the 3 coal belt consuming 180 megawatt power plant at 100% capacity, while still having lots of coal left over to build extra smelting stacks for other purposes. And 52 hours in, we are finally sorted on all the resources for power and green signs, and a full 10 lanes of ore are already crossing the copper patch, leaving limited space available for other purposes. The coal belts are so long that the four belts together are holding a whopping 67,000 pieces of coal, which means we have placed over 8,000 belts to transport the coal back home to the base. Building all of this has taken so long that playing Mike has run out of things to research entirely, despite the 1000 times science cost multiplier. He has researched all red technologies, except for shooting speed 1 and fast inserter for some reason. That is a weird combination of text to leave out, man. We again start cooking up a green signed ingredient design balanced around consuming and producing resources counted in belts or belt fractions. One inserter needs one iron plate, one iron gear and one green circuit. We need a full belt of inserters, which means a full belt of green chips, which means one and a half belts of copper for copper cable for green chips, which is indeed the entire one and a half belt of copper requirement for green signs. To avoid having to route and recombine multiple belts to a single assembler array and avoid all the problems that come with that, like inserters preferring to draw off the near side of the belt, we have divided production into two identical copies instead. Which means each row of copper assemblers gets three quarters of a belt of copper. Each line of green circuit assemblers will then need half a belt of iron to combine with the copper wire. And each line of inserter assemblers needs half a belt of iron directly as well, which means they can share a full belt of iron between them. They also need half a belt of gears each, which need two iron a pop, which means the dedicated gear assemblers for inserters get a full belt of iron each. That is four belts of iron and the full one and a half belt of copper consumed by inserters, which means the remaining one and a half belts of iron should be destined for making yellow belts. Let's check. It takes one iron and one iron gear to craft belts, which is three iron in total per craft. But indeed, you get out two belts as a result, which halves the iron requirements to the one and a half belt of iron we've got remaining. So we join the remaining one and a half belts of iron with a splitter, and similar to the copper, we set input priority on the full belt to ensure that its flow is never interrupted. And that should send three quarters of a belt of iron to each line of yellow belt assemblers. Nice! We again build enough assemblers to provide 900 signs per minute worth of resources from the Grey Mark 1 assemblers. And the new mouse overproduction numbers were of great help in determining the number of assemblers needed in total, as well as determining the required amount of inserters to keep up with the assemblers. While the future faster blue assemblers would theoretically need only 5 inserter assemblers instead of 8, our long-handed inserters will not get the accompanying speed boost those blue assemblers require. There is no real harm in overbuilding assemblers though, so we won't be rebuilding this area after blue assemblers become available, we will merely upgrade the assemblers and call it a day. Speaking of overbuilt assemblers, the only thing that's left to do is to reconfigure the lab area to its original design state, converting the bottom row of science assemblers back to green signs, and fill in the hundreds of missing inserters between the labs. Painstakingly, I might add. A couple misplacements, but in general, decent. Okay, we're gonna get above 300 SPM now. Labs are gonna switch on. <laughs> and then double the entire thing. Because with just 60 green science assemblers, we were down to 300 signs per minute. While 120 red science assemblers were able to do 720 signs per minute, with the slightly slower green science recipe, the 120 green science assemblers can only do 600 signs per minute. 
As soon as we get our hands on the one and a half times faster blue assemblers though, that will finally multiply up to the full 900 signs per minute design specification. And won't you know it, despite researching seemingly useless text like physical damage upgrade 1 earlier on, playing Mike actually is researching the blue assemblers as we speak. Has he seen the light and is this playthrough finally going to go in the right direction? Beautiful. Were the earlier red researchers like Damage 1 and Lambs just mindless busy therapy? And then we have 600 SPM. Or is something else going on entirely? Find out... Next time.